Good afternoon, everybody. Um, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Fiona Stubbs. I'm the Careers Manager for the College of Medical Veterinary and Life Sciences. Thank you for turning up to the webinar today. Um, I'll introduce my panellists in just a moment, but in true style, I just want to mention the usual housekeeping bits. Um, this is a webinar, so your, please keep your video and um, your sound uh, muted. We are recording. The recording will be, uh, found, be able to be found on our YouTube channel and library uh, in a few weeks' time when it's all been edited and tidied up. Um, can I ask if you, if you want to ask questions, please ask them at any time. Use the Q&A function that you'll be able to see at the bottom of the page um, rather than the chat. So use the Q&A function rather than the chat. Um, anyway, I'm going to get on to our panelists, but this is our fifth um, speaker panel of the day. It's the microbiology panel, uh, and it's been part of a two-day science fair. We've got two more panels after this, <coughs> Global Mental Health and Psychology, and then the in-person um, em uh, Employers Careers Fair in Wolfson Medical build Building Atrium tomorrow between 11 and 2. So please come along to that. Anyway, I would like to introduce uh, my colleague, Leanne, uh, and also Jenny and Emily, our guests for today. So I will start off um, by asking the first question. Uh, and then Leanne will step in and ask some other questions. So Jenny and Emily, can you just please remind us of your job title, uh, where you work, um, what that company does, and a few typical things you might do in a day or on your job. So I'll start with Jenny this time. Yeah, no problem. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Jenny, as uh, Fiona said. Um, I'm a research associate at Enterbiotics. Um, Enterbiotics is a microbiome therapeutics company. So um, essentially, we are interested in developing therapeutics which um, help contribute and restore gut health. Um, a typical day for me, um, because we're quite a small company, my role is quite diverse, so I might be doing some lab experiments, but then I might have some meetings with different companies outside of antibiotics, as well as um, other internal meetings with different departments, such as our quality control or quality insurance. Um, so it's definitely a mixed bag, and um, <laughs> every day is definitely not the same as the day before, so it's very high-paced. Um, but that's what I enjoy about it is the fact that it is just um, sometimes a bit crazy um, <laughs> but fun <laughs> and always, always diverse. Cool. Thank you. Um, Emily. Yeah. So I work as technical customer support at a company called Kinostics. So it's a molecular diagnostics company. And basically we manufacture controls for quality control for your PCRs. So a range of different pathogens. Um, and I'm kind of involved in obviously the customer support side. So we have customers who come to us whose PCR aren't working or they don't know what they want to buy. So I'll troubleshoot with them or help them along kind of that way. And as Jenny said, um, we're kind of the same. So it's quite a small company. So I get pulled into lots of different things. So I'm also kind of involved in the R&D side, which is quite nice. My role is fully outside the lab. So it's fully office based, but we're involved with product design from the beginning to the end. So you still kind of get that side of it and we still attend conferences and stuff as well. So you kind of get to keep up with the R&D and the academic side, although you're not directly involved in it. Can I just ask one question uh, for both of you before Leanne asks the next one? Did you deliberately target to work for smaller companies rather than the sort of corporate global companies or was it just by chance or accident? So, Emily. For me, it was more just by chance an accident. It's quite nice um, because you do get to see lots of different sides when you're in a small company, whereas I think in the bigger companies, they're more kind of structured and that you are compartmentalised into a small section of it. Okay. And Jenny? Yeah, the kitten theme, Antibiotics is quite a young company. So it, I think only like last year, they had just under like 20 staff. So now we're about kind of close to 50 um, so it is growing quite rapidly and it's it's really good to be part of a company at that point in their trajectory where they are going through rapid growth. Um, it's also a good time to get involved with a company because it means you're more likely to be kind of projected 
up mm. the kind of scale as well. So although you might start at a kind of entry level, there's more opportunity for you to be able to develop your career and go into different areas because as Emily said, it's not quite been fully compartmentalized yet. So you're not quite stuck in R&D or QC. There's options to kind of get experience in different areas. Thank you. Uh, great answer. Yeah. Um, thanks, Fiona. Um, so both of you obviously done a microbiology degree within Glasgow universities, and you both went on to do postgraduate. You've both got your PhDs, but both of you have done a slightly different way of doing it. So for example, Emily, I know you went straight from undergraduate into your PhD and then into the position you're in now, yeah. your company. Whereas Jenny, you left after your undergraduate, got a wee bit of experience yeah. elsewhere, came back, done your PhD, and then into the company now, which is great. There's no, I think it shows there's no right or wrong way to do things. I was just wondering, obviously both of you have got PhDs. Are there positions within your company, if you don't have a postgraduate degree, are there opportunities for straight from undergraduate into positions or the company you're in just now if I could start with Jenny maybe yeah so definitely um at antibiotics we have quite a although we're small there's a lot of different roles so we have production staff that quite often have a microbiology background and um, because it's quite essential for the product that we make but they are more hands-on and involved in the manufacturing side of our product and um, we also have QC scientists which also have a kind of similar um, microbiology background, biomedical, um, and they use more of their kind of analytical skills, but it's more of a kind of structured role. So that kind of suits people that are quite organized, like to document very well. Um, but most people that do a PhD know that <laughs> you end up writing on bits of um, <laughs> blue roll and things, you know, so QC isn't maybe the domain that some of the PhD goes into, but definitely like you don't need a PhD to have a career in science. Um, if, from my own experience, if you do want to be more involved with research and development, it's really good to have a PhD to have that underpinning knowledge, which allows you to go into a research and development job with an understanding and confidence to do projects. That was definitely one of the things when I left my undergraduate and I went and I worked as a technician, um, I felt that my lab skills were maybe not as um of a, of a certain start level than compared to what I thought when I then started working with other scientists I thought oh actually maybe like a master's or if I'd done some summer placements things and had a bit more um, independent work in the lab those skills would have grown and I would have maybe been more confident in them as well yeah absolutely and yourself Emily for your company there's opportunities for people straight out undergraduate degree yeah, I mean, it's very similar for me, to be honest. Um, my first job when I came out was a QCMD, so it's the sister company of Kinostics. And for the job that I had, it was technical project leader, which is basically, I suppose, kind of been in charge of timelines and things, but from a more technical point of view as well, where you're involved in design and things as well. But <clears throat> for that role, I didn't need a PhD. Um, it's one of those things that they're kind of coming towards. They like you to have one, but it's definitely not a requirement. Um, there's many roles within QCMD that don't. They do like people to have um, a microbiology background or at very at minimum kind of a science background because obviously you work for a scientific company. It's good to just even have an idea of the terminology and things that you're going to see. But we have project managers who aren't necessarily technical, but they're involved in the timelines. We have QC scientists, R&D scientists, and really it's only the senior positions that they look for you to have a PhD for. Um, and Gnostics as well, um, for my current job, they did require a PhD, but again, it's just because they're really looking at the nitty gritty for the technical side of it. So they want you to be able to understand kind of all the, as Jenny said, the underpinning knowledge that they expect you to have. Um, but there's roles within Gnostics as well, um, downstairs, where downstairs, and <laughs> the production and manufacturing um, scientists. So that's kind of, they're, they're obviously got background in microbiology, but not necessarily PhDs as well. Yeah, I think it's just great to hear the diversity in positions that are open and mm -hmm. these companies as well. Um, and Jenny, do you think that you, I don't know, your experience of leaving your undergraduate and then going into industry made you think, okay, this is maybe where I want to go. And in order to do that, I have went back and then done your postgraduate degree. Yeah, definitely. Like LifeArc, they are a contract research organisation and they were working on like medical diagnostics. 
and a lot of the scientists that were leading the projects, um, they all had a PhD. And it wasn't to say that there was a glass ceiling for people that didn't have a PhD, but for my own interest, where I wanted to be involved in those projects and seeing myself maybe one day leading projects, be more involved in that side of the research, but with the application for it to have a real life impact, that was my kind of goal. Um, and so that's what I wanted to be able to use my degree for. But it wasn't until I went into industry that I'd thought, actually, maybe I need to strengthen my underpinning knowledge. My um, undergraduate was a great foundation, but I didn't quite realise until I had exposure to what other people had gone on to do that I maybe kind of sat back and thought, actually, there might be a requirement for me to go and further develop my skills, my knowledge, um, and definitely going and doing a PhD was an option for me. Um, but it was also a good point for I thought as well was the PhD, you are paid, you get a stipend. Um, and obviously I had become quite used to having a salary. So for me to then make that decision, instead of maybe doing a master's, I, and I know there is funded master's out there as well, but for me, the PhD was more of an attractive option I knew it was going to give me the skills, but I actually also knew that it was going to give me the um, kind of salary benefit that I was going to be losing if I decided to take a step back and go into study. And I know sometimes that's not something that, you know, everybody thinks about. But if you are in that position, um, you know, and the cost of living and all that jazz as well, you know, times are tough. So if you can get paid to study, then that for me was kind of another driving factor. Yeah, I think it's just really nice to show that just because you choose a career straight out of your undergraduate, you're not committed. There's a lot of flexibility there and you just adapt to what you see is where your future is going, which is really nice and reassuring for our um, students to hear. I also just wanted to touch on briefly um, the roles within the company, because some students leave their undergraduate and think, I don't want to go near a lab again. And they think because of that, we can't use their microbiology degree. But do you think that within your own companies, there's a lot of positions still open to students that they don't need to work at the bench are there any specific examples I could go Emily first maybe yeah absolutely I mean I would say 90% of people in the company don't actually work in the lab um, and probably about 40% of them have microbiology or some sort of biology degree so the project managers, like I said before, they they tend to have science backgrounds just so that they have an awareness but they're not necessarily in the lab um, it's really only our R&D department in production that will be in the labs, but there definitely are, especially kind of coming towards um, big data, bioinformatics, that sort of stuff. There's obviously going to be roles where you're not actually sat in the bench, or if you are, then it's for much shorter amounts of time than you would be normally. Jen, is that a similar situation? Yeah, I think as well, um, roles that I maybe necessarily <clears throat> wasn't aware of and especially also when I went to work in life art because they were research most were research scientists but coming to antibiotics because we now have like our MHRA accreditation we work to like high GMP standards so we have a whole quality system and we have quality scientists which includes quality control scientists who are more involved in the laboratory doing actual kind of QC tests but we also have quality assurance where they are more paper-based and they do all our documentation. Um, and then for a lot of that, they are kind of standard operating procedures, which have to do with the things that take place in the QC lab and throughout the business. So an underpinning of science or microbiology um, is really good in those roles. Um, and I will just mention as well that we actually are currently looking for a QA scientist um, or QA analyst and a QC scientist at the moment. Um, you'll be able to find those jobs on the antibiotics website. Um, so, Perfect. Yep. That's a nice wee plug there for our students <laughs> yeah. looking for a job. Exactly. <laughs> that is great news. Uh, shall I carry on with the next question now? Yeah. Thank you. Um, there's sort of always a focus on encouraging students to volunteer in any area and get involved in extracurricular activities uh, to develop their skills and strengths. Um, did you, what did you do while you were a student in these areas uh, that may have aided you in getting your chosen career? So if we start with Emily. Yeah, 
So um, I actually did my undergraduate in microbiology at Glasgow Caledonian University, so I'm not 100% sure on the structure at Glasgow Uni, but our structure is in our third year. You can either continue with your top modules or there's the option for a placement module, but it's kind of one of those things that you have to find it yourself or you have to kind of reach out um, to companies and ask if they can take you on for a semester. But <clears throat> I, did, um, I started mine at the dental school, so it was... Um, one of the lecturers at Cali knew my supervisor, my PhD supervisor, who sent me up for this third year placement. And that was for three months. It was just for one semester. And then you kind of write up a report and that's you finished. Um, but it was great to do. It was one of those things that you're just not going to get that kind of time in the lab doing top modules. So it was really great to get that and kind of see people who actually work in academia and research um, and get a better idea of what they do. It also led on to a summer studentship the same year, which was great. Um, it meant that I only had to work in the pub part time. <laughs> but um, yeah, so that, that was another six months of experience that I wouldn't have had if you hadn't signed up to the placement module. So if there is an option for placement or if you know anyone that works in a lab, I would absolutely ask if they can take you on because it's just invaluable to have. Thank, thank you, Emily. Uh Jenny, any thoughts on extracurricular science or non-science that you might recommend? I think probably when I look back at my undergraduate, I wasn't very good at maybe reaching out to people. Um, and when I used to, when I now speak to people and like yourself, on they say they you know, did placements and like summer studentships, and I don't know if maybe at the time I just wasn't as aware of them, or if there was more of a focus on a kind of academic path rather than a kind of industry focus and just like say Leanne's done a fantastic job at kind of bringing that more into the um, Glasgow University cohort course um, kind of making more of awareness toward it but what um, I did instead was I was a STEM ambassador and I really enjoyed that because it meant I got to go out to schools and because I was from kind of around about Glasgow I had, I had a car so I could go out to schools and um, the technicians and the Joseph Black were actually really helpful as well they'd give me some plates and things to take out we took out some like fluorescent bugs so you know kind of students could see that and for me when I was doing my undergraduate I actually thought that teaching was what I kind of wanted to pursue um, so that was a kind of reason for being involved with the STEM sort of side but kind of looking back now I wish maybe I'd had the confidence like approach lecturers that were maybe giving us um, our lectures to find out if they had any opportunities to come and do a few weeks in their lab um, like that studentships looking reaching out LinkedIn didn't wasn't a thing back then or maybe wasn't as popular but maybe if it had been I might have reached out to some companies to see if they had um, internships mm -hmm. like this year antibiotics we took on three interns and um, one from immunology at Glasgow University and she was in our QC team and I mean, she had like, she really, really enjoyed herself. And I think actually we've ended up kind of keeping her on part time. So there's, as Emily said, there's opportunities if you kind of get a step in the door and you prove your kind of self during the time that you're there, there's definitely more likely to be an opportunity for you to kind of stay on or at least have a contact to maybe come back to. So don't be afraid to reach out to people. The worst thing people can say is no. Yeah, I think that's really valuable advice. And just to jump in quickly, Fiona, um, for our microbiology degrees this year, we've actually set up an option in the final year to offer internships with local companies. So instead of doing a project for your owners year in the university, you can go out to industry. And we've actually set one up with Emily's company this year. This is our first year trial in it. And I think it does give that amazing experience for students to gain <clears throat> an understanding of working in the workplace while they're still studying and it does, like you say, Jenny, gives you that foot in the door that if you do do a good job, then they might take you on afterwards. So I think it's a really nice selling point, particularly for the microbiology degree. I know sports science do it as well. But because um, people at this state in their final year, they might know they don't want to go into the academic route. So it's a nice opportunity to try your dip your foot in the water as well, I suppose. Yeah, I mean, I think, I mean, I'll second that. I think this is a great opportunity for students. Um, and we are within the university within the staff trying to build up some connections and um, of companies that will offer these uh, short-term internships but if any of the students know of any contacts they've got their neighbor's neighbor or someone like that then think and ask them because uh, you never know what opportunities that person might have access to <clears throat> anyway 
<clears throat> Excuse me. Moving on to the next question. I think the question I was going to ask is it has been answered. So I'm going to ask this question. Hope it won't floor you. Um, but I just wanted to know, Jenny and Emily, how did you get your job? Um, and have you got any tips on how students might look for, for jobs? Jenny, I'll start with yourself. Yeah, so um, I actually use LinkedIn to find this job. So my PhD was quite focused on the microbiome. Um, and in particular, I was going to be looking at fecal microbiota transplants, or as we're now kind of re-changing the name to intestinal microbiota transplants. Um, so when I found out that there was a company in Scotland that was basically manufacturing products to do exactly that, I started following them on LinkedIn, um, kind of responding to the posts that they shared. Um, and it was actually the CEO that reached out. I had kind of spent a bit of time during lockdown kind of revamping my LinkedIn profile to have a bit more about what my PhD project was. So there was maybe a bit more information there that kind of set out in quite a simple way what my skills were and what my interests were so they could easily see that what I was interested in aligned with their interests. Um, and that was what the CEO came back to me and said. And that kind of opened a door for conversations about the types of jobs that I was interested in. Um, and what they had available in the company and then kind of led on to having a kind of Zoom chat to speak a wee bit more about PhD um, and then an interview and then I was offered the position. So safe to say I jumped at it. <laughs> great. We, we love the fact that you love LinkedIn. Leanne and I are great, great supporters and promoters of it. Uh, do you, while we're on that, Jenny, do you know of any other top tips in terms of others getting jobs or looking around? I think just being proactive on it and following companies that you have a genuine interest in because your LinkedIn can probably become quite filled with things that you're maybe not as interested in. So you might miss something. There's so many companies out there and I quite often share, uh, follow like kind of newsletters because they'll publish maybe companies that are up and coming, um, you know, kind of like innovation forums where they'll maybe be, especially for in industry, releasing different companies that are starting up. Um, I'm interested in the microbiome, so I follow like microbiome newsletters, which quite often have companies or certain individuals, and then you can go and connect with them. And you don't have to be too cheesy on it either, but I just would say to people, be your genuine self, because then at least if someone does contact you, you've not then created this persona that you're not, you know. Um, so it's just about making genuine connections with people, staying up to date with it and being engaged with it. Post your own things as well. Post things that you think other people might find engaging, um, you know, and treating it respectfully as well. It's not a social media page, so you don't want to overload it. Um, but be professional and think and, and look at other people's on LinkedIn. You will see if people look at you. But if you're maybe looking at someone's profile to see how do they lay it out, what kind of information is on there, nobody's going to message you and say, <laughs> You saw you were looking at my LinkedIn, or they might, and they might offer you a job, who knows? Um, but, you know, you can use other people's profile to say, oh, how's the best way to present maybe all the skills that I've had from my undergraduate and things. So it's it's a good, I think it's fantastic, you know, as you said, a big advocate for it. So Yeah, and, and, and Leanne and I both are. I mean, if you really want to be more more uh, anonymous, you can use the settings on LinkedIn to, 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 not, to not be followed in a way, but... Anyone that I find that has looked at my profile, I find it hugely complimentary. Yeah. Uh, it's got to be a reason why they've looked there. Anyway, on that, thank you, Jenny. Uh, some really good good advice there. Emily, how did you get your jobs? And have you got any tips for students uh, where they might find a job or, or, or otherwise? Yeah, so um, when I was coming towards the end of my PhD, um, my PhD focused the majority the majority of it was on thrush um, and molecular biology. So I was quite keen to stay in the field of molecular biology, but where I was in my life as well, I was seven years into being a student and I desperately wanted to get a mortgage. So I was quite eager to leave um, academia as well and kind of be able to get a full-time contract and have a real job. <laughs> um, so the manager at QCMD was in contact with my supervisor um, and had asked kind of before they advertised the job did, was there anyone that would suit kind of thing so I interviewed for it and I got the job at QCMD and then I was there for about eight nine months 
um, doing the technical project lead. And while I was there, I'd kind of been trickling in and out of Indeed and having a look at what was on. I really enjoyed the customer support side at QCMD when inquiries were coming in and you get to do a bit of investigation and kind of see what was going wrong. Um, so when the job came up for technical customer support, I'd applied for it and I'd spoken to the CEO. Obviously, it's the sister company, so I was aware of him as much as I didn't know him. Um, and I interviewed for that job and got it. So uh, as Leanne says, it's very much who you know. Science in the West of Scotland is a small, small company, <laughs> as it were. So it's it's a really good idea if you can to just get your name out there. Yeah. Getting contacts is definitely the best sort of thing you can do. I would say don't be afraid to go into other fields as well, kind of dabble in things like immunology, cytology. It's always good to kind of expand, yeah. see where you fit. Thank you. So I mean, it's very much been the thread through your two conversations have been about sort of networking and get to know them. I suppose the lesson is you've always got to be on your best behaviour because you never know who, is, who the person is around the corner. But I was also su suggest to the students that, you know, there are job agencies, search agencies, recruitment agencies, whatever you want to call, just punch that word into Google with science or pharmaceuticals or whatever after it and you'll get a long list of companies. They can be helpful and frustrating in the same uh, same measure. Um, a multitude of websites, I mean, Emily mentioned Indeed, uh, monster.com, lots of other websites, uh, but LinkedIn has probably got more jobs than anywhere else in the world. Uh, Leanne, do you want to ask the last questions and then we can take it to the students? Yeah, I know we're coming towards our end of the time. I want to make some uh, time for our students to ask questions, but I suppose this is quite a cheeky one in the sense of, asking you guys to predict the future of microbiology and where the jobs are going but it's more broadly like where do you see life sciences going in the next five ten years or even longer is there a particular area you think is going to expand um and some things I was thinking of like, like COVID over the last couple of years has that really pushed people more into microbiology and is there more microbiology jobs now I think Emily from your company's point of view you had to quickly adapt to produce products to suit the yeah. pandemic and for testing in that way. And in general, in terms of antibiotics, it's quite a new and exciting area of research um, that's ongoing. So I don't know, maybe you might think respectively, both of your areas are going to expand in the next few years. Is there just something in particular you think that will take off? Right, Emily, if I could come to you first. Yeah, no, that's fine. Um, I mean, as you say, we've probably got a biased opinion in that I think COVID and stuff has definitely put a rocket under molecular biology. Suddenly everyone knows what PCR is <laughs> and what it does. Um, what I've also noticed being here is that there's been tons and tons of pop-up labs in the last year or two years. And they're kind of coming around now where they've done the COVID testing, but they've produced all their COVID stuff and they're kind of done with it. So what they're trying to do now is specialise. So what we're finding is there's loads of inquiries of people who they want gastro bugs, they want STI bugs, they want respiratory bugs because they're trying to specialise. So I think we're going to see a massive increase in molecular biology, people doing PCR. I guess the thing that I've noticed as well is the point of care. People are much more interested in being able to get a diagnosis in a couple hours when a patient is still sitting in your clinic sort of thing, which there's probably going to be, I suppose, I drift away from culture methods and actually being in the lab and it'll be more kind of rapid diagnosis kind of thing and that's yeah. my biased view <laughs> <laughs> and Jenny yeah as you said um, we're probably quite biased in the sense that we're microbiology focused and, and certainly myself and with antibiotics we're really kind of interest in the microbiome but it's a field that although it's been around for kind of a few decades but it's just still so much that's unknown about it and that kind of definitely will be expanded upon but there's also so many different areas now that especially like the gut has been linked to other different parts and Emily kind of touched on it earlier but like kind of expanding your knowledge into like words immunology and psychology and, and there's now so many links to different diseases as well so I kind of definitely see the future going towards more like precision medicine understanding exactly what's going on and if that's something that you're interested in or want to learn more about, I'd definitely say it's a worthwhile pursuit. Same as well for artificial intelligence, not just bioinformatics, but, you know, actual virtual reality and all these sorts of things where, yeah, there you can learn bioinformatics and, and doing sequencing things. But actually, a lot of companies like ourselves, 
where we maybe are kind of lacking in that gap. We're looking for companies now that will do all that for us, the platforms, you know, behind the actual, not just sitting and doing the coding, but workflow systems and companies that are developing, you know, big data sort of thing. Um, I think that's where a lot's going to go, and especially as well, because for our um, company, we work with a lot of like uncultural bacteria so you could do all the experiments you want in the lab but if nothing grows you don't know so you know again sort of that kind of idea towards like artificial intelligence and predicting models and and, and and coming away from the wet lab you know maybe there'll not be as many scientists in there people will be more doing like proof of principle with using knowledge and sequence data and clinical data and bringing that all together to actually make a bigger picture um, that's kind of where I kind of see a lot of science going so if that's your kind of thing then it's definitely worth kind of getting more involved with it. Yeah I think you both of you just summed it up nicely that microbiology is not just at the bench looking at agar plates all day long and just because you've done a microbiology degree doesn't mean that you stuck for life with it. I mean it's a nice thing to be stuck with but there's so many other areas it overlaps with and you can feed into those areas um, and some very quite diverse that you might never think you could go into. So I think that's really inspiring, I think, for our students to hear. Great, thank you. Really interesting, thank you. So I'm going to go on to the student questions. We've got two here. Um, we've got, and this sort of feeds into sort of what you just said, do you have any tips for getting into a career within epidemiology with a microbiology degree? Jenny. Yes, I would probably say if you're interested in things like epidemiology, doing maybe something towards public health is an interesting route to go down. Um, I had a friend that did like a public health master's and it was a two year master's. I think it was run through Edinburgh University and it was two years long and they did various different placements um, throughout the world, you know, um, and it sounded fantastic. Um, and now she is working with um, the NHS and she is on um, the kind of a scientist associate career path. Um, I can't remember the name for that just now. It's got a kind of title. I don't know if any Leanne or Fiona, you know what it's called. It's like within the NHS scientist roles. Scientist training programme, was it? Yeah, not? maybe yeah, something we like that. We had a presentation at 11 by, uh, 11 by then. There was diff there's different programmes for different um, areas. I'm not sure if they do it in, that, in this epidemiology, but why don't everybody on the call go and have a look? Yeah, <laughs> yeah at least they website. might do like a kind of public health one sort of thing. Right. But definitely, I think if you're interested in epidemiology, it's kind of a good place to start looking or places like the CDC that I don't know, they might have like internships and things or studentships, you know, it's always worth going and looking on these websites, although they seem like big names, but actually you might sometimes surprise yourself what's open to you. <laughs> Emily, do you have anything to add to that? I think Jenny pretty much covered it, yeah. Public sectors or public health even is going to be the place to go for epidemiology. I mean, everywhere has epidemiology to an extent, but to actually have a job that specialises in it it would probably be public health. Cool. Thank you. Moving on to Clara's question. What would you say are the major differences between academia and industry? And what advice would you give to students navigating that switch? Interesting question. So, uh, Jenny. Um, so I'd probably say the difference between industry and academia is academia is very um, narrow spectrum. A lot of the time you're looking at very specific projects on a spe specific topic. I just for, for example, say if you may be looking at gene regulation and you're looking at gene regulation, a particular type of E. coli, and you're looking at like the protein interactions that that gene is involved with, that is the kind of minute detail you're going into. And that underpins microbiology and is fundamental and is very interesting, but kind of zoom out a wee bit and maybe that gene links to a disease and you know, actually we need to be able to identify that gene. So we need a diagnostic for it. And that gene's been linked to actually forming cancer and predisposed people. So you're working for a company that is developing that diagnostic. So it's got a real life application and doctors are going to purchase that from you. So it depends on what you're in, where your interests lie. If you really love that fine tuned detail, I think academia is definitely an, an area where you have the flexibility and the freedom to explore that. The only downside being is that sometimes it can be limited. The contracts are short. You maybe have a three-year contract, 
potentially a five-year contract is the highest I've ever heard of. And once that funding's lost, that is kind of the end for you unless you reapply. Um, and it's also very difficult to navigate your way up a kind of scale in academia because there's so few positions. Whereas in industry, there's a lot more options. Um, you have a, a permanent contract, um, you know, so there's more kind of security, I would say, and that's just my own experience from industry. Thank you. Um, Emily, do you have anything to add to that answer that Jenny's given? The only thing that I would add um, is the academia, I suppose, if you're really into novel things and being the first to know about something, then academia kind of has that, that aspect to it. I think in industry, obviously, when you're working with things that are established, then I guess you kind of miss things as they first come out. Um, and it's maybe something that you'll catch up on. Um, so I guess if you if you want to be kind of on the leading end of it, then academia is probably where you are. But at the same time, just because you went into either academia or industry straight out of your degree doesn't mean that you have to stay there by any means. Okay, thank you. Uh, we've got another question, sort of feeds off this one, but it seems to be a more personal question. Uh, why did you choose to enter industry rather than continue working within academia? Emily, can I, while we have you uh, on screen, um, so why did you choose to enter industry rather than continue working with academia? You sort of alluded to it before. Yeah, for me, it was quite a lot to do with personal circumstances. As I said before, seven years of being a student is a long time. Um, I've been renting for six and a half years and I just wanted to have a mortgage kind of start off sort of thing, which as Jenny said, it's just not something that you can necessarily do if you stay in academia, um, especially if you're looking at postdoc positions. They're, they're limited and it's not to say that you can't get a mortgage and you can't live a life as a postdoc but um, for me it was just something that I wanted to I don't know take a break at least um, I'm not necessarily sure I want to stay here forever but I've only been out of academia for just over a year so it's not been that long. And has it been a good choice? I think for me it's definitely been the right choice um, it'll be based on you based on your interests based on your circumstances but for me it's definitely been the right choice. Right. And Jenny, uh, why did you choose to enter industry rather than continue in so academia? Similar to Emily, like personal circumstances, I wanted to be able to have that job security, but I was in quite an interesting position. I was the, My PhD project, we were able to write a grant on that, and my um, PhD supervisor actually was awarded that money um, from the grant. But at the time, it was quite difficult to navigate the waters because we didn't didn't know if he was going to get the money or not and at the time I was in a bit of a kind of tricky situation um, did I start applying for jobs did I want to continue the project I knew the funding would be for three years I was really interested in it and also spent a lot of time developing the assays and things to kind of get the kind of beginnings of the project kicked off so I was quite invested in it personally as well um, but I kind of took the time and this is maybe a, a few years down the line for a lot of the kind of guys on this call but I spoke to quite a lot of different people postdocs people that had kind of gone past that phase and the advice that I was kind of given was that if you wanted to stay in academia then you know that was absolutely fine but eventually what does happen is you start to become too expensive for industry um, and your skills don't quite match up to the position of industry that your salary would match just from the kind of industry point of view of maybe being exposed to regulatory bodies, working in different, um, your skills as a scientist are, you know, really top caliber, but your multidisciplinary skills maybe don't match someone that has been in the industry for the same amount of time. But, you know, and so that was just something that was quite interesting to me. And I, I know that's a kind of um, predicament for some kind of current postdocs that I know is that now they are too expensive. They're used to such a salary that they can't really afford to drop unless they were given maybe a consultant role in an industry company. But for example, to come into like a job like myself as a research associate, they wouldn't be earning the same money because the company wouldn't justify that. Although they had all those years of experience in academia, they would be missing some other business skills that would be fundamental to the role. Um, so, and, and that was something I hadn't really considered. So I did then decide to take the leap because it wasn't guaranteed that I would receive the money from the grant. I applied for the job and it just happened that the job came through first 
So I'm and I, I'm glad that I did do that. But if I had, if I'd taken the postdoc, I would have probably have taken that postdoc for that three years and then look to going into industry rather than probably taking another postdoc and another postdoc on top. But that was just my own experience. But I just wanted to say that like, because I thought that was good advice. I think that's really, really good advice. It's managing people's expectations. Uh, and, you know, ultimately, if they wanted to go into industry, having to take that wage drop, which, as you say, not everybody can. Can I ask, and this is, it's not a personal question about your pay, but do you know what the average entry salary is for a company like yours? So if a student left um, either a graduate or, or having done a PhD, roughly what the, uh, uh, the sort of entry salary might be? I would, Jenny? Say, I would say for, if you have a PhD, um, then you know your kind of starting salary would be starting about 30,000 and going upwards. Um, if you don't have a PhD, in, but you have a master's, you're probably looking at like the kind of mid 20s to late 20s. Okay, that's that's great and quite healthy. Yep. Uh, Emily? <laughs> Yeah, very similar story. If you've got a PhD, you're probably looking at starting about 30. If you don't have a PhD, if you come out your undergrad, then you're probably looking between 20 and 25. Cool, great. Now, there's just been another question added. Uh, Clara, uh, in the two minutes we've got left, um, when would you recommend making the switch from industry to academia? When would you make recommend making the switch from industry to academia, right after PhD or before? I don't know if you mean, Clara, the other way around. I think so. Yes. So when would you recommend making the switch from academia to industry, after PhD or before? Is that possible, uh, Jenny? I'd Maybe probably mean straight after undergrad, is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. I think it depends on your skills from your undergraduate. If you wanted to pursue a PhD, there's opportunities to go into PhD training programs that will take you straight from your undergraduate. There's also master courses or go out into the world of industry and see if you like it and if you want, can also stay there but if you come back to do a PhD maybe in that time you decide you want to stay in academia that fine tuning discover novel things is what's up your street and that's absolutely fine but if you don't then like I say I did a kind of short postdoc for maybe about five months while I was writing my thesis um, and then I kind of left but again it's it's totally down to your personal circumstances as you said Emily by the time you've reached you've finished you think yeah you've done almost like 10 years at university you're ready to have some stability but likewise doing a kind of three-year post-up again it also depends on what opportunities are available at the time yeah. you know you can't necessarily plan all those things but maybe if you can be open to all and when if you do a PhD just ensure that you have the skills that will make you attractive to industry as well um, if that's what you think you would want to do afterwards that's probably what I would suggest um Emily I don't know if you've got anything to add but uh, no, I'm no, I think not... that. <laughs> great great uh, not meaning to be harsh there um, I'm, I'm being quite military in my timing today because we've got lots on and I know that both of you've got busy jobs so just really want to thank you for your uh for your time and sharing your expertise and wisdoms. I've had a few takeaways and I know the students will have done too. Um, so just left to say, uh, thank you also for Leanne and making the initial co uh, connections. Uh, it's been a re really great 45 minutes.